Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here with us uh, we, for our brand new series, uh, Feeding sorry, <laughs> feeding Babies from the Torah to Today with Ravneet Leah Sarna, who I know has written and spoken about this topic in the past, but I don't think we at Drusha have ever had a formal class on it with her. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, if you don't know her, Ravneet Sarna is the Associate Director of Education and Director of High School Programs at Drisha, and has also previously served as Director of Religious Engagement at Anche Shalom Bnei Israel Congregation in Chicago. Um, she was orda ordained at Yeshiva Mahara in 2018. She holds a BA from Yale in Philosophy and Psychology, and she also trained at the SKA Beit Midrash for Women at Miguel Oz, Drisha, and the Center for Modern Torah Leadership. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we start. Um, if I either already have or will um, invite you to be a panelist, that does not create any obligation or pressure for you to declaim on anything. It just will give you the ability to turn on your camera, which we would love to be able to see your faces, uh, and you'll be able to raise your hands to ask questions. But we do ask that you stay muted when you're not speaking. Um, and other than that, happy learning. Thank you so much, Romney. Sarna. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm super, super thrilled to be able to share some of these sources and ideas um, with the Drisha community. Uh, this is my first kind of like public Drisha class since coming back from my maternity leave. So definitely it's very like these questions are very live and relevant for me um, at right now. And um, I have a um, I have a four and a half month old, um, who hopefully will not make himself uh, known to you during this mm -hmm. year. And, um, and um, I have over time, you know, just as I've been learning through Daf Yomi and, and, and learning Gemara over the years, I've, I've paid a lot of attention to really all of the kind of random places where infant nutrition just like appears. Um, it's one of the rabbi's go-to sort of metaphors for all kinds of different things, as we'll see over time. Um, and it's also like much more complex than we ever might imagine. So today we're going to look at different, um, we'll have some, some texts by way of introduction, texts that kind of get to why I think my experience and many people's experience is like, oh, everyone talks about feeding infants and particularly breastfeeding as if it's like so natural and easy and obvious. And then the experience for very many people is like, wow, this is actually so hard. Um, and actually this is like not easy at all. And, um, and so like, has it always been this hard? That's one of the questions. And, and then we're gonna see through just sources from the Talmud and the Midrash that actually, yes, it's always been, or for since, since ancient times, it's been very, very hard. Um, and yes, people have always attempted alternatives. We're gonna see what some of those alternatives were um, or alternatives that they kind of maybe dreamed about, even if we're not gonna accept them as like kind of scientific fact or reality. Um, um, or they're kind of like what they might have imagined as miraculous that today we can actually say, oh, we actually can do that. Like, how amazing is it that that it doesn't today require a miracle in order to keep a baby alive under these conditions? So that's something that we'll also see today. And just to give you a sense of kind of where we're going. So today we'll just be talking about kind of different forms of baby nutrition that the Talmud might imagine um, after we after we do some some introduction. Um, and again, the reason why, like all with a framing of like, has it always been hard? Well, you only need alternatives because it's hard. Um, if it were super easy, no one would no one would have alternatives. No one would need them. Um, next class, so next week, we'll talk about kind of the economic perspective. Um, so we all know that feeding babies is really expensive. Like who pays for it? Who's responsible for that? Um, the Gemara has and and um, and forward into medieval sources. Also, we'll take a look next week. Um, the Gemara has like some really interesting stuff about that. And then that also gets in the questions of like who is in charge. And so we'll we'll from there look at questions about weaning also, because that becomes once by the time you're if you're if you're in kind of a breastfeeding relationship for more than maybe like six or eight months, then by the time maybe mom is ready to stop, the baby's not ready to stop, or the baby is like no longer interested, but mom wants to keep going, all sorts of questions about that. So so that'll be next week. 
Um, and then after that, we're going to look, there's just a lot, a lot of really interesting texts about kind of like the special relationship that's formed with a baby and a caretaker while you're feeding. Um, so we're going to look at some texts about that. And then um, we'll also um, look at, uh, and, and in the last class, we'll talk about um, Shabbat because we all know you can't, um, you can't like milk an animal on Shabbat. So then what, uh, so then how does that translate into humans? And we'll look at texts and sources about that. And we'll talk about some modern day stuff, like um, how do pumps work? Uh, we're not the first people to kind of have, you know, hand expression is really, really old. And we'll explain obviously what that term means. Um, and, and we'll see it, we'll see it in, in really classic sources. So that's, that's kind of the scope of where we're going. I forgot to mention that in the third class, when we're talking about that like special relationship, that's when we're also going to spend some time asking those questions about like smooth and like, how does your, your, body and the way we think about a person's body when they're in a breastfeeding relationship how how does how, how does her relationship with her body and other people's potentially relationship with her body um, change or not change um, because of this like new functionality that her body might have um, so that's kind of all the different topics I'm hoping that we'll get to it's kind of ambitious to do this all in four classes but um, it'll at least be a start and a taste um, and hopefully we'll like pique people's interest for, for more study on this, I think really kind of like fascinating um, topic kind of in general, but then particularly fascinating like within, um, within a Jewish lens. So I'm going to share my screen. There was a source sheet sent out to people who registered and maybe um, I can drop it in the chat also, um, but we're just gonna start at the top here. So. Um, where I want to start is with this question of like, shouldn't it be easier? So, and in order to like really get into that, we have to understand what the Talmud even thinks breast milk is. Um, so at the beginning of Masachat Nida, we have this idea by Rabbi Meir who says that like, oh, there's this other thing about breastfeeding, which is that um, you, a lot of people breastfeeding suppresses their menstruation. And they knew this already, obviously, um, in the Talmud, in times of the Talmud. And so Rabbi Meir says, how does that work? That the blood, menstrual blood, it spoils, and then it turns into breast milk. So like, where did my period go? Oh, my period is coming out in my breast milk. It's the same substance, but in like this kind of different form. That's what they're sort of imagining is happening and obviously like if you got pregnant and could have a baby then you probably menstruated so shouldn't it so like shouldn't breastfeeding be as easy as menstruation not to say that menstruation isn't sometimes painful and uncomfortable but it doesn't necessarily take like effort <laughs> um in the way that maybe um that certainly breastfeeding does um and and we have all of these texts that that kind of lead in that direction. Um, so here's just one example of it. This text is about um, this, it, it's playing off this pasuk from Mishlei. Ayelet ahavi ve'alat chen dadeha yerucha bechol eit ba'avatat tishgat tamid. A loving doe, a graceful mountain goat, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be infatuated with love of her always. Um, and it, the rabbis understood this verse to be talking about Torah. And so in this piece in Erevin, or Shmuel Bar Nachmani goes, goes kind of phrase by phrase within that um, text, and within this pasuk, and explains like how the Torah is each piece of it. But I'm obviously here for the breastfeeding part. So Amar Vishmul Bar Nachmani, my dechtiv dadeha yarucha bechol e. What is the meaning of that which is written? Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Lama nim shalu divrei Torah kedad. Why were matters of Torah compared to a breast? Ma dad zak holds mancha tinok me mash mesh bo mote bo chalav. Just as a breast, whenever a baby searches for milk, he finds milk in it. So too with Torah, Afi Vri Torah, Kol Zman Shadam Hogabahan Motabahan Tam. Just whenever a person meditates upon Torah, thinks about Torah, he finds new meaning within it. So 
it's a very beautiful idea of Torah that whenever you go searching, it's always there for you. That's definitely my experience with Torah. That is not everyone's experience with breastfeeding. But I do want to say that the, it's texts like these and ideas like these that set up new moms to like, oh, of course, that's easy. Um right it says so right in the Talmud whenever a baby looks for milk he finds milk um isn't that exactly how it is and that's very much kind of like the cultural story about how infant nutrition goes like oh yes there's tons of nutrition available for babies and you just like just like put the baby to the breast I'll be fine la, 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 la. um and that is um very much kind of you can see that that cultural understanding of how this works in some ways is quite old right um and 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 it leads to all of these sorts of beautiful metaphors and this is the one we're looking at today but we'll see many more um over the course of this uh, over the course of our time together um and and I think a lot of women have the same feeling that's described in this text from Masachet Brachot we're talking about Chana. Chana is um a woman in the book of Shmuel who really wanted to have a baby. And she, she's in fact Shmuel's mother, by the way. Uh, she really wanted to have a baby. She really wanted to have Shmuel. She goes to the Mishkan and she prays. Uh, Hana spoke on her heart, says the verse. And Rabbi Elazar, Mishim Rabbi Yossi ben Zimra says, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Elazar said the name of Rabbi Yossi ben Zimra. What does it mean that she spoke on her heart? It means al iskeliba, that she spoke concerning matters of her heart. So what did she say? Amral Fanav, she said before him, Ribono Shalom, master of the universe. Koma Shabarata Baisha, everything you created in a woman, lo barata davar echad levatala, you did not create one piece of a woman in vain. Everything has a purpose. Inayim liro, eyes to see. Uznayim li shmoa, ears to hear. Chotam lahariach, nose to smell. Palida bear, mouth to speak. Yadayim la sopa hamelacha, hands to perform. Labor, raglayim lahalich pahan, feet to walk with. Dadim lahanik pahan, and breasts to nurse with. Dadim halalu shinatata alibi lama, right? This woman who's struggling with infertility, Hana, she really wants a child. She says, Why breasts were created for nursing? These breasts that you placed upon my heart, why are they there if I'm not going to have a child? Aren't they there to, to nurse with? Lola hanik bahan, tainli ben vaanik bahan. Grant me a son and I will nurse with them. A lot of women feel like, or are taught to feel like, I was born for this. Why do I even have this body part if it's not going to do the thing that I want it to do? Or if it's so hard or so painful or so exhausting or so expensive or so culturally impossible because I have to work or all of the many different myriad kinds of problems that can come up um, with breastfeeding. And at the same time, we sort of have the story of like, of course I'm going to breastfeed. Why do I even have this body part? And it should be as straightforward as moving my hands around, right? Um, and um, and that that feeling that, and, and it, it seems from the text, by the way, that Hannah had like a quite successful sort of nursing trajectory with her son Shmuel, but, um, but this idea of like, these are body parts that I have, it should be, I should be able to use them um, is both something that like our culture definitely kind of says to women and that women really internalize about themselves and about their own bodies in ways that then when the nutrition plan doesn't work out or when that's never the plan for whatever reason can be really hard or really disappointing um, exactly because of this feeling that Hana here is expressing. Um, and, and to say it kind of even more sort of like intensely. So in Eicha, we have this Pasuk that says, Gam tanin hen. Even jackals offer the breast and suckle their young, even these like monstrous evil animals. Um, but my poor people has turned cruel like ostriches of the desert. Um, the tongue of the suckling cleaves to its palate for thirst. 
Little children beg for bread. None gives them a morsel. So even the jackal breastfeeds its baby. Um, but in the times of the destruction of the temple, uh, Jewish women were not. They weren't maybe able to, or they chose not to. Rashi imagines that they, they, you know, everyone, if everyone is starving, um, the women would choose not to nurse their babies. Shachayehem kudim lahem, lachayebnehem. Mahmat Hara'ab, for their own lives come before their children's lives because of their hunger. Um, and I, I I don't know, the pasuk seems very judgmental, like even a jackal feeds their babies, but the, but the, but the Jewish people aren't. Um, and Rashi seems like a little bit more sort of either like matter of fact or like less judgmental or like wouldn't anyone make this decision? Um, to like not nurse your baby, maybe because you're putting your own life first, maybe because you have other children you have to care for, so you have to survive. Um, and um, and I would say that the the Rashi um, direction here is very interesting to me because I do think that a lot of people end up in this place of like either I could like do all this crazy stuff in order to like successfully kind of lactate. Or I can give my baby formula and be able and like keep my mental health intact or not spend all day doing this or share the labor and be able to be present for my other children um, or be able to provide for my family or all kinds of other decisions in that direction. Um, and, and Rashi sort of just saying it as like, yeah, it's it's really sad and really hard. Um, but these are like decisions people sometimes have to make. Um, not to say, by the way, that like we're living in times of starvation. Some people in the world are, but many, probably none of the people listening to this talk right now are. Um, and if you are, definitely reach out because we can definitely do our best to help. Um, but but that, that same sort of like we're all making trade-offs and like it, feeding babies is and how we do it is part of that big calculus of our lives that we are not infinitely resourced, you know, even when we're wealthy, we're still, time is not an infinite resource. Um, and so making those trade-offs affect the way we choose to feed our children, um, even sometimes in ways that are horribly sad as described in Eicha. Um, and you could read this text and say, oh my God, if I'm not gonna feed my baby breast milk, like if my baby isn't gonna nurse, then um, then I'm as cruel as an ostrich in the desert, then I'm a, a worse than a jackal, um, right? You could walk away with that impression. And yet at the same time, we know that there are other texts, lots of other texts that see that breastfeeding is really hard. So in Masachet Tani, we have this description of the Anshe Mishmar. So Anshe Mishmar are, um, Sorry, Anshe Mishmar are the Kohanim, the like set of Kohanim who would go to serve in the temple and they would go in shifts. So the English here calls them like the priestly watch. And corresponding to each priestly watch is Anshe Ma'amad, are um, members of a non-priestly watch who would remain in their town, but they would all gather together and they would have this certain um, ritual that they would do in their town um, that would kind of like correspond to what was happening in the temple, kind of in Jerusalem, far away. So um, the Brita says, Sinur Banad, Anshe Mishmar, Hayumi Palim al Korban Achem, Shikabel So and the members of the priestly watch who are kind of up in the temple doing the thing, they would pray on, on behalf of the, they would pray that the offerings of their brothers would be accepted with favor. The Anshema Ahmad and the, the non-priestly watch, they would stay in their own towns, meet Kansin Labet HaKneset, and they would assemble in places of assembly. They translate here synagogues, but don't exactly imagine like what our synagogues are like today. Maybe more of like a JCC. <laughs> um, um, they, they would gather in, in their in their gathering places, Vyoshim or Bata and they would fast four fasts, Vishini, Vashabat, Shlishi, Ravi, Hamishi on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Bishini al Yarday Hayam. On Monday, they would fast for the seafarers. Bishlishi al Hokimi Barod. On Tuesday, they would fast for those who walk in the desert. Berevi'i al Askara Shalotipo al Hatino Kot. On Wednesday, they would fast over croup that it shouldn't befall the children. 
On Thursday, they would fast for pregnant and nursing women. So if every Thursday of the year, somewhere, somewhere in the country, people are gathering to pray for pregnant women, okay, you can understand why they need to be prayed for, but also for breastfeeding women. Why is it that we're praying for breastfeeding women as if they are in the same level of danger as seafarers and people who walk in the desert? And by the way, like what do those other three categories, um, seafarers, people who walk in the desert, pregnant people, when they complete that thing that they're doing, right? They all bench gomel. Those are like classic hagomel categories of I was in a dangerous situation. I'm not anymore. I'm so grateful. Um, and we that classically childhood was very dangerous. You don't bench gomel when you reach bar mitzvah, but that's like a kind of interesting idea that maybe you should. Um, and um, so what is it, right? On and then there's this other category of mini coat of women who are nursing. And the Gemara explains why we're praying for them. So Ubaru we pray for pregnant women that they shouldn't um, God forbid, miscarry. And what are we praying for for the breastfeeding women for the mini coat? Mini coat Niko at Beneham. We pray for the nursing women that they should be able to nurse their children properly. So on Thursdays, every Thursday, there would be place, people gathering, fasting for a full day, praying that nursing women should be able to nurse their children appropriately. One day a week, right? Thursday, that's the day you pray for the nursing women. So, like, why is that necessary? What is so what, like if it just flows the way every time you go to Torah, there's always something there for you. And every time a baby goes to breastfeed, there's always something there for it. Then why, why in heaven's name would we need people to pray for breastfeeding women the same way that we pray for people who are wandering the desert or off at sea, right? These things just don't add up. The story we're telling about breastfeeding doesn't add up. Um, and the last thing I want to add in here um, is not just, so in this situation, it seems like, wow, breastfeeding, there's actually like danger involved in breastfeeding, which is, by the way, like not wrong at all, <laughs> um, right? Breastfeeding carries dangers of, um, of mastitis, of clogged ducts, right? There's all sorts of specific like things that can befall someone who's breastfeeding. And women who are breastfeeding experience a lot of stress and anxiety around those kinds of dangers. Um, but there's the other piece about breastfeeding that makes it really hard, which is just that it's expensive and taxing on lots of different levels. So this Mishnah is really interesting because it's a Mishnah that really kind of lays out quite specifically um, what, what kind of economically a husband owes a wife and what a wife owes a husband. Um, and this is someone who they're not living together for whatever reason. So this is Mashret uh, Ishto Ayade Shalish. So someone who feeds his wife by means of a third party or a trustee. So how much does the trustee have to give to this wife? And so it, it goes through, I didn't bring you the whole Mishnah, it's quite a long Mishnah, but it's you can't give her less than two cob of wheat, four carb of bar barley, and it goes through all the stuff she needs for her to eat and for her clothes and for her all different stuff. Um, and if he doesn't kind of support her, then everything she earns belongs to herself. But if he does support her, then what she earns actually belongs to him. So mahi osalo, what what is the amount that she actually needs to earn for him? Mishkal chamesh slaim, shtibi uzash, and eser slaim begaliel. This is like money means different things in different places. So she has to spin the weight of five sela of threads of warp in Judea, which is equivalent to 10 sela, according to the measurement of the galley. Okay, whatever. We're not going to get into like what all those details mean. Um, but right, you get this picture, right? He has to provide for her economically. She has to provide for him maybe economically. But but there's a carve out. What's the carve out? If she is nursing, the required amount that she has to kind of contribute to the economy of the, of the family, like she doesn't have to kind of um, spin as much 
warp thread, as many warp threads or whatever, because she's nursing. And more than that, and he has to add to how much they're feeding her. So not only does she kind of do less in terms of household labor, she actually then is also consuming more during this time that she's nursing. Um, so I think that's just like, um, and then and then the, the Mishnah just ends out, right? What is this? All of these amounts and measurements, what are they about? That's kind of the poorest. These are all minimums. But in the case of someone, Bimichubad, right, someone who is kind of a prominent, honor, honorable, respectable man, um, all the amounts are according to his prominence. Um, but just like, I think it just gives you in, in this very concrete Mishnah, that's not just like, oh, he has to give her clothes. It's like, no, this is how much exactly clothes he must provide for her and exactly these types of shoes and exactly this type of whatever, right? In this like very concretized Mishnah understanding of what a husband owes a wife and a wife owes a husband, all of that shifts when she's breastfeeding because it is so consuming because breastfeeding is so difficult that she needs more calories and she can just accomplish less. Okay. Um, and the and then the Gemara on that Mishnah is also really interesting. So it says, like, what's the reason? Why is it that she um that she doesn't have to like give as much to the household and she receives more food? So the question is, so that they're wondering, like, is she, is the husband responsible for feeding children? That's the, like, bigger conversation going on here. Um, maybe it's because the husband is just paying for the food of the baby also, or it's because she is ill. And then the uh, Gemara goes on to say, okay, but if that were the case, they wouldn't say she is nursing. They would say, they would just say, if she is ill, and that would be any type of illness. My So what is the situation? Why does the, why does the Mishnah say if she's nursing? Maybe the Mishnah teaches us that all nursing women are considered ill. And you'll see that that kind of line gets quoted in all sorts of places when we're talking about nursing on fast days and whatever, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but just this, like for, for me, I'm here less for like the halachic consideration and more just for this idea that actually nursing makes you ill. <laughs> it makes you sick. So it's not just the like, wow, it's, it consumes a lot of energy. No, like you're actually, um, you're actually sick from it. Um, and then we, the this is actually the end of a parak, and as you might know, Prakim and Gemara often end with like interesting or funny or like kind of take a left turn right at the end sort of line. So this is that line here. So we admire Amar Bishuv and Levi, Mosi Fim La Yayin Shayayin Yafela Halab. It was stated that Rabbi Yishuv and Levi said, wine is added for a nursing woman as wine is good for milk. And you should just know there's like all this. Classically, it was like, oh, breastfeeding women shouldn't drink alcohol. And now there's like a whole website that you can like calculate how much alcohol you're consuming um, and whether you can like still nurse after having consumed that much alcohol. But here, Rabbi Yishuv and Levi is saying, yeah, wine is good for your milk. Drink up. So you take that into Thanksgiving with you. Um, so that was all kind of by way of just like laying out the field, right? On the one end, we have all these stories of like, what is my body for if not to do this? It should be so natural. It should be that anytime a baby goes to nurse, it just blows out so easily. We have that kind of narrative. And then there's this other kind of narrative of like, maybe all nursing women are sick. Maybe like it's extremely, um, it, it's extremely like expensive to nurse. Um, maybe, um, maybe we should be praying for all nursing women that they can actually do this successfully. Maybe nursing women need our prayers. Um, and then we have that Rashi from, from Echav, just like, yeah, like sometimes you have to make really hard decisions um, and eat under the circumstances of your life, whether they're the most horrible circumstances of the times of the destruction of the temple where people were starving, or they're just our own kind of scarcities, scarcities of time, scarcities 
of resources such that I have to go back to work within the first year of my baby's life, all of those kinds of things. Um, so with all that complexity, um, I want to look at some examples. We're gonna look at six different examples in the next hopefully half hour or so um, about, um, we're gonna look at six different examples of what a person might have done in the Talmudic times if breastfeeding wasn't working out for them. Um, Okay, I'm just looking at the, I'm just looking at the chat, right? Randy says, right, starving women wouldn't be able to breastfeed. Yeah, so that's definitely a piece of it for sure. Um, did anyone else want to just pipe up with any questions about what we've seen so far or any like comments or feelings that are coming up for you real quick? You can do like a minute or two. Anyone has anything they want to jump in with? Uh, okay, well, there's plenty more material to get through, so, um, but definitely feel free to, like, put things into the chat or even interrupt me if there's anything that's happening that uh, feels confusing. Um, so this first text I want to look at is one that, right at the beginning of the formula uh, shortage crisis in the United States, this was in Dafiomi, um, like, before people, like, fully knew what was happening, um, before it really made the news. Um, but so, um, and that kind of like got me onto like, oh, these texts are amazing. <laughs> um, because the Gemara actually, people, so one of the things that happened in America when there was a formula shortage, all these people started sending around like, oh, like my grandma used to make formula like this. Um, and then like all of the, um, all, all of the like public health community had to be like, do not do that. <laughs> like that is not good for babies. But in a world without formula in the way that we have it, um, it is not the case that people were just like, okay, now my baby will die. You know, like they actually did everything they could, even at great expense to try and figure out how to get their baby the nutrition that their baby needed if they couldn't breastfeed the baby. So even in the Gemara, you have this idea that you basically have like an attempt at expensive breast milk alternatives. I should also mention that formula is extremely expensive <laughs> um, and that you can, um, there's like a special kind of um, food stamps for formula called WIC. Um, and the whole politics of WIC are part of the problem, for being honest. Um, and you can definitely read that up on that on your own time, or um, you can ask me about it at a different time. But, um, but definitely um, it's expensive because the materials that need to go into it are expensive. It's expensive because the level of hygiene ideally required for its production is kind of extraordinary. Um, but it was expensive even when people were just like making it on their own at home. So here's the, um, like Gamar here in Yubamo is talking about um, women remarrying and how long do you have to wait from your divorce or your husband dying or whatever um, before a remarriage? And the answer is you have to wait like until you know whether you're pregnant or not. And if you are pregnant or if you're um, nursing, then you have to wait until like that's over before you can remarry. But here we're specifically talking about the prohibition against marrying a woman who's pregnant with the child of another man. And you might've thought, right? The Gemara might've says like, you might've thought like, okay, you know that this baby is the baby of husband A. Let her get married to husband B. And she'll have the baby of husband A. If she waits two years until the baby comes into the world, she's still going to be the mom of baby of husband A. She's just going to have, that baby is now just going to have a stepfather or whatever. Um, like, what's the difference? Why does she have to wait? So here's the Gemara's, one of the Gemara's attempts at an answer. Um, so the Gemara says, Ella Samba Ubarat Lameni Ka Kaima. A typical pregnant woman is going to nurse her child once it's born. Dilma i Abra Umacharcha Umi Acharcha Lava. So maybe after she has baby from husband A, the Gemara says, she'll be nursing baby from husband A, and then she'll get pregnant with baby from husband B, and her milk will dry up. 
the couple A and she'll and the baby will die. Baby from husband A will die because her nurse will her her um she'll be nur- she's nursing baby A. She gets pregnant with baby B, and her milk dries up during the pregnancy. And so the Gemara says, nami. Hold on, but why? Uh, oh, and then uh, right, and then it'll kill baby A is the end of that sentence, right? So nami. So okay, but then any woman who is um pregnant who is nursing like like who like why like that just happens naturally it could have happened to husband b's kind of own baby you know like that could happen between baby b and baby c also um and the answer is no so if it's his own baby then she'll feed him um it's this kind of like weird word that seems to me and like she'll for him <laughs> um she'll feed him eggs um um oh sorry the period should go there so right so if it's if it's his own baby then he'll provide for it this like milk substitute that's very high protein combo eggs and milk so then it says okay so so fine but if it's just her baby and not her husband's baby because it's the baby from her previous marriage then she could do the same thing she could also give it this like milk substitute the answer is no husband number two is not going to want to provide this expensive expensive nutrition for a baby that's not his own and so then it says, okay, um, so then she should, mom should sue the inheritors of husband A in order to provide for baby A. And Abaya says, a woman is not going to come and sue her own family, potentially even her own children, um, in Beitin. Um, and in the end, and the end result will be that the baby from baby A will die. And that's why we don't let her get married until that baby is kind of like firmly on its own two feet. Um, so a little bit complicated. I hope that people kind of sort of followed what's going on there. And I, I wasn't, um, if, if, if you have the source sheet up on your own, you'll be able to kind of like look at the whole source in one page. That might make it a little bit easier to read. But just this idea that there's this, thing of Beitim and Chalav that you can feed a baby. <laughs> That's the main takeaway. This is Talmudic formula. This is Talmudic baby nutrition that is not coming out of anyone's breasts, um, except for maybe a cow or some other animals. Um, um, and so just to say, right, we might imagine like, oh, all formula was like invented by Abbott or whatever. Like that is not the case. We're very fortunate to live in times where we have many of us have access to formula that can keep our babies healthy but we are not the first people who kind of could do this theoretically um and it apparently worked well enough that the assumption was this works but if you can't afford it or refuse to afford it then the baby will die but not if you give this to the baby then the baby will die um okay so that's option number one option number two is maybe like the most obvious one is someone else should nurse the baby. That's also expensive, right? Because you're literally hiring an entire person <laughs> um, to take care of a baby. Um, and the Gemara, this is like such a kind of clear option for the Gemara that they just have sort of like a halacha about a wet nurse. Like if you're a wet nurse, here's the halacha for you. That's like the, the Gemara kind of like speaks directly to that person, which is amazing, <laughs> really interesting. Um, so here's just like, here's a little bit of like Hilcho wet nursing, uh, right? So someone gave a child to a wet nurse and she agreed to nurse him. Hariza lo tanikimo lo benav lo ben chavertha. So the wet nurse, she has to be um, like monogamous to this baby. Like she can't nurse another woman's child and she can't she definitely cannot nurse um her own um her own baby alongside the baby that she's being paid to nurse um 
more than that, paska kima uchalet harbe, even if her, she only managed to negotiate a small allowance for food um, along with the payment for nursing, she must eat a lot so that she'll have enough milk. Um, and she has to eat a diet that's like conducive to making good milk. She cannot eat, th- eat food that is bad for her milk. Um, and then it says, okay, we understand why she can't nurse her own baby alongside this baby she's being paid to nurse, but why can't she take on a second baby? Um, right? Because you might have thought, uh, right? You might have thought, okay, obviously her own baby, like, yeah, for sure she would give preferential treatment to it. But just like taking on a second client, if you're a wet nurse, like if you have enough milk, like why wouldn't you? Um, so it has to come in, right? You might've thought that maybe that would be okay. And the Gemara actually says, no, like you have, you can only be a wet nurse for one baby at a time. Someone's paying you to be a wet nurse. They're paying you to be a wet nurse for that baby. Full steam ahead, one baby at a time. Um, and, um, and then the Gemara says, you know, oh, but if she's only given a little bit of money for food, how is she supposed to like feed herself the rest of the way? The answer is she's supposed to pay for it herself, says Rosh Hashanah. And then it says, what are, you know, what are the things that she's not allowed to eat? And there's actually like this very long list of foods that are bad. So here, we'll just do this in English. Uh, so Rav Kahana says, hops, young green grain sprouts, small fish, soil, pumpkin, quince. That's really going to put a, that's really going to put a, put a wrench into your Thanksgiving plans. Pumpkin and palm branches. Um, uh, kutach, which is like everyone's favorite dairy dip in Babel, small fried fish, all these items are bad as some cause milk to dry up and some cause milk to spoil. So apparently there's also two things that can go wrong with your milk. You can um, dry it up, okay, you can understand what that is. Um, but achri chalva is interesting in particular because um, what that first source we saw was that what is milk says Rabbi Meir milk is is um is like spoiled menstrual blood and now all of a sudden you have the milk then spoiling a second time because you've like eaten the wrong small fish or too much pumpkin um so that's also just like really interesting we do actually know that breast milk changes we'll see this when we talk about the man but the breast milk kind of changes depending on like what you eat and it has lots of different flavors within it um and so um there is like something to this of like but but the question is like would a baby like reject it based on what you ate um and that's a little bit more complicated but the other way to think about this by the way I should just mention is like in terms of when babies have allergies often we'll say oh like mom has to cut dairy out or mom has to cut eggs out or mom has to cut whatever it is all kinds of different things out of her diet um because it's affecting the baby in in all these different ways um and so I guess like a wet nurse would maybe like have to do the same because she has to like make sure that what she's the product she's producing is is like the of a quality that is what she's being paid for um so that's just like really interesting it's really interesting that like we're buying some we're paying someone for like a bodily function we're paying someone for a bodily fluid like this whole thing the ethics of wet nursing is like fascinating obviously like we can't really be like sitting here in America talking about wet nursing without just like recognizing the very very painful like slavery wet nursing history um on the soil and um that is like a kind of undertold story and history of the United States um and and it's also part of why like I think the idea for moms today of like giving your baby to someone else to nurse in addition to like milk is in fact a blood product and like you could get all kinds of diseases through breast milk um but also like it just like it feels like awful it feels wrong or like unethical in some ways and I think like that's a little bit of like where it comes from not to mention that like there is no other like bodily function that we pay people for um but 
uh, yeah, it's like really kind of interesting, that whole dynamic. Um, and then um, there's one other piece about this, and we'll get to this much more next week. When we talk about the economics, we'll look at the source more in depth. But the other piece about wet nursing is like, okay, so it's one thing if like you can't breastfeed, but what if you just like don't want to? Um, and so this is a case, um, and, and we'll see this a lot more, um, where, where it gets interesting, right? So Amar of Huna, Badaklan of Huna Barchinana. So Huna Barchinana tested us by asking the following. He omerit lahanik, vuhu omer shalo lahanik. She says she wants to nurse. He says, I don't want you to nurse. So he says, give the baby to a wet nurse. Shom im la. We listen to her. Fascinating reason. Tara didahu. She's the one who is suffering from the engorgement of her breasts. That's one way to understand this, right? Like, what is her suffering? So Rashi's going to say, she wants to nurse because her breasts are painful and nursing will relieve her suffering. There could be like an emotional suffering of like, I don't want to be separated from my baby. I want to be close to my baby in that way. I think there's a lot of different ways that we could understand this like Zara Dida. Um, um, Cause right, I kind of set it up like, oh, actually like breastfeeding is maybe what's painful, but actually also for lots of people, like not breastfeeding is super painful. Um, so it's definitely one of those like, Everyone has their own experience and lots of different experiences are really super painful. Um, okay, so what's the opposite though? He says, I want you to breastfeed. And she says, I don't want to. What's the halacha? So um, anywhere that she is not accustomed we accede to her desire. So again, the question is like orcha of the police, like women here don't breastfeed, but I want you to, then she wins. But if um he orcha who love orcha am I, but let's say what she um what she wants um um if like sorry one second. I got lost in my head for a second. I'm turning off. Right. So if it's a place where she doesn't normally, like she comes from a place where women don't normally breastfeed or like in her family, they don't normally breastfeed. We listen to her, but if it's in her, but if for her, it would be normal to breastfeed. And for him, it would not be normal to breastfeed. Who do we listen to? Batardi de Azlinan or Batardi de Azlinan, do we which of them do we listen to? And the and the answer is um Ola Imova Ina Yuredit. So she kind of ascends socioeconomic status, but she does not descend with him. So if in his family um people don't normally nurse, but in her family they in his family they pay for expensive alternatives like a wet nurse then um, he should pay for it for her if she wants it. And if in her family they normally do, then even if in his family they don't, he should still has to pay for it because she can only rise in kind of class status through him and she shouldn't um, be dragged uh, down by him. Um, so anyways, we'll, we'll look at this more. Um, um, We'll look at this more next time, but there's just like a lot of great stuff happening here, right? Right, so this is about Chava. This is a description of, of like, she was the mother of all living. She was given to her husband for living with him, but not for experiencing pain with him. Which is just like, again, like, like wow, that's so fascinating. Uh, there's so much going on here, but I do want to, I'm just noticing the time and I have so much left to get through. Um, so another alternative that gets meant so that, okay, so odd con, um, wet nursing, and we're going to come back to this last piece of the economics of it next time. Um, it, it's like really just such an interesting bar. I'm like so sad that I'm just like reasoning through it. Um, okay. The, so a wet nurse is a woman that you pay to nurse your baby. Another option would be just like your friend or your husband's friend who's like, oh, you're having trouble nursing? Here, let me do that for you. 
which is like very anathema. Like you can't imagine like, I don't know, like hanging out with my friend and like, she's like, her baby is like, you know, almost done nursing and she's sad about it. And my baby is driving me bananas and wanting to nurse all the time. And I'd just be like, here, have that. Um, but that's definitely like the world that the Tosefta at least kind of recognizes. But the Josefta says you can't force someone to do that. So he says, "In ha'ish kufat ishto shetanik et ben chavero." Um, so a man can't force his wife to nurse the son of his friend. And similarly, because you might think it's about like female bodily autonomy, but it's not exactly because it also has this like household economics piece. She also can't like bring a new infant into their house. She can't force her husband to allow her to nurse the son of her friend. Um, so it, on the one hand, you have this idea that um, this a person could just like nurse her friend's baby for her, um, but you need consent from like a, a, a woman who wants to do that for her friend needs consent from her spouse and a man who wants to do that for his friend of like, oh, let, let's see if my wife will be willing to like keep your baby alive. She needs to consent to it also. It needs to be a, like a gift that this couple, this household like give to another family. But but definitely the sense, it's all about like, can you force someone? Not is this allowed from which we can deduce that like, yes, indeed it is allowed, which is just, you know, quite like fascinating. Um, okay, so we saw that like in Yavamo, we saw that um, a different part of Yavamo. We're back in Yavamo now, but we saw um, we saw that um, that combination of like milk and eggs. So now we're just going to see that there's another option of straight up like nursing from an animal. Um, so Tashma yonik tinok veholech mi behemat mea. A child can suckle from a non-kosher animal, um, and we don't. We'll get into this idea of unique sheket leader um, when we talk about weaning. That's like a weaning conversation. Uh, we're not worried about him. Like we're not worried that it's disgusting. And at the same time, when we're talking about food for a baby, lo yachilanu nevelu do trefod shkasim uramasim. So we may think, oh, it's a baby or it's a kid. Like they don't. They're not obligated in mitzvot, and yet you're still not allowed to feed them animal carcasses, any kind of like non-kosher animal um, or creepy crawlies or anything like that. And yet, mikulan yonik mihan vafil v'shabat. And at the same time, a human Jewish child can nurse off of a non-kosher animal, a non-kosher creature, but um, you cannot eat that creature. So that's a really interesting, I think, reflection on um, the difference between like food and milk, that like milk for a baby is this like absolute essential thing. We don't care where it comes from, get whatever is working for you, great. You know, camel milk is your thing, do it. Um, if that's what's gonna keep you alive. And again, what, we're gonna circle back to questions about like, does milk need to be, um, is there such thing as like kosher breast milk? Does formula need to be kosher? Um, there are famously now some, some, some formulas that are not, cannot be made kosher. So that's like, it's still very, um, very relevant. And those are formulas for babies with like particular kinds of difficulties. Um, and uh, so we can see, right? Like the, the, there's kind of like a beginning for that conversation of like babies nursing in from animals that are not kosher even though you couldn't hand that baby a slice of bacon um so that's kind of okay i have six minutes we have two really great sources left um this is the source again we could spend an entire hour on it's this was kind of famous though so we'll we'll breeze through it a little bit um but we have this bright about a um man who was very poor and his wife died while they had a baby who was nursing and he did not have enough money he could not pay a wet nurse a miracle happens happened to him that his um his like nip, nipples turned into female type breasts and he was able to nurse his 
his his son. So we have this this like chest feeding was what we would call this now when a man is able to breastfeed. Um and um and but in in the Talmud it's this kind of like miraculous thing. And I definitely would say that um one of the things that like bottle feeding enables as opposed to um breastfeeding is it enables fathers to bond with their babies over feeding um in a way that a lot many men experience kind of jealousy over the breastfeeding relationship you know like this is my son too this is my daughter too this is my baby I want to be able to spend that kind of like loving time with them that mom can um how can I uh how can I have that and they can have that through bottle feeding not to mention that the idea that you would have parent parental units none of whom are able to breastfeed is not particularly uncommon not not only because you have cases where mothers die but you might have gay couples or whatever and so you have this Talmudic model of fathers who are able to have that kind of like feeding relationship with their babies um and it's described as Talmud as like totally miraculous and that salones that he was that a father was able to feed his baby um and um I think that's that's like quite kind of resonant um, and beautiful. And we're gonna skip the rest of this, but definitely it's like an interesting reflection um, by the Talmud about like how difficult nutrition is. Um, like why is it the case that um, it was easier for God to give this man the ability to lactate than it was for him to just like get enough money to be able to hire uh, uh, wet nurse um, so there's the, the Talmud's reflection on that is kind of interesting um, and where I want to wrap up with is actually with tube feeding this is an amazing source we're talking about this is the the Midrash's imagination of so right we know that that Paro in Egypt says any boys who are born are gonna have to be thrown into the Nile but the only boy we ever actually see him throw into the Nile is Moses um and so it's like where did the babies go like what what happened to the babies that were born in Egypt we know lots of them were born um and so here's here's the midrash from Shmot Rabbah on that so Rabbi Yehuda Omer um oh so this is on um like when this is on Shira the Song of the Sea um and who like recognized God when they saw him when they pointed and said this is that Kaylee Ron who this is my God and I will glorify him like who who knew what God was or like what God looked like and the Rabbi Huda is going to say who me Amar Kilusa Kadosh Baruch who who spoke praises of God Hatino Kot the babies Otan Shaya Parov Vakesh Lashlich Leor the ones that Pharaoh wanted to throw in to the Nile. Because they are the ones who recognize God. Kitzad, how? When the Jews were in Egypt. And a, Jew, and a Jewish woman was going to give birth. She would go out into the field and she would give birth there. Once she had the baby. She would just ditch it. <laughs> and she would pass it off to God, the Omeret, and she would say, Master of the universe, I did my part. Now you go do yours. said, God would then descend with all of God's glory. And he would cut their umbilical cord, Umar Chitan, Vesachan, he would wash the babies and anoint the babies. And he would have two, maybe tubes in his hands, two pipes in his hands, maybe. And one would give the baby, one from one the baby would would suckle. Um, oil and another one they would suckle honey. Shnemar vini kayu devash me salad. It says um, that um, that God would nurse them uh, honey from a rock. Vahyug daily masada and the babies would, from God's tube feeding, they would flourish and they would grow up in the field. Vahyug um, daily and once they grew up, Hayun Yishnesim Lavatehab et salabotehan, they would go to their homes by their fathers. 
And their fathers would ask them, who took care of you? And they would say, a young man, very good looking, he would come down and he would take care of all of our needs. The Kavan Shabal Yisrael Ayam, and when the Jewish people arrived at the sea, Otana Tinoko, those very babies were there. The Herola Kadash Berkubiyam, and they saw God at the sea. He'd kill Omim Labotayam, Zahu Tosha, Yom Salanu Kotana Dvarim Shainu Vitrayim. That's the guy who did all that stuff for us, who took care of us when we were in Egypt. Um, and they would, and then they would say, Zaili, that's my God, and I will glorify him. So this is now another kind of miraculous version of how do infants in times of distress, when breastfeeding isn't working, when the mother can't be there with them, because if the baby were found, you would be thrown into the Nile. What do you do? YouTube feed the baby, or in this case, God tube feeds the baby. Um, it, and so um, hopefully today, and I know I'm at time, and I always try and end as close to on time as I can, but I'll stick around and answer um any um any questions that people might have um hopefully today we got a chance to see yes on the one hand Judaism does share this kind of cultural narrative of like breastfeeding it's amazing there's so much milk it's perfect for the baby blah 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 on the one hand and on the other hand you've seen oh yeah it's really hard lots of things can go wrong lots of things can happen um, and here are some alternatives that have been attempted over time of ways to feed babies, even when breastfeeding does not work out. Um, and, and I think for me, like part of what, what I want to say about this is like, I think there's this sort of imagination that like, oh, like if you just did it, then like you could breastfeed. And the answer is like, no, that has never been the case. It wasn't the case in the Talmudic times. It's not the case today. There's lots of ways to feed babies. Um, and even the Talmud kind of recognizes lots and lots and lots of those different, um, lots of those, those different ways. So I hope today you got a little bit of a sense of like how many different texts talk about this um, talk about baby nutrition or fascinated by it. We saw things from all over the Gemara and we're going to see more. Um, we saw lots of different genres also that kind of touch on this. Um, and a lot of them are like fun and curious and interesting. Um, so definitely stay tuned. There's a lot more to get through in the next, um, in the next three classes, but thank you all for coming out and I'm happy to stick around for a second. Um, if people have questions on anything we looked at today. We'll go. Thank you so much, Rebunit Sarna. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who joined us. Uh, I just one quick announcement is just that we will not be having classes on Thursday as it's American Thanksgiving, but we do have some really exciting things tomorrow and just going on all the time. So please check that out at 5783.drisha.org. And looking forward to learning with you again.